Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's year. Tonight's year, Menachem, you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Tonight's year is a very special year. It's tonight's year 55 from Let's Get Real. Um, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Tonight's a very powerful, special topic. And um, I appreciate it. First, I want to start off with all the people that watch every week, all our viewers, uh, for posting on the WhatsApp statuses and telling people about the amazing program. Please tell your family and friends and post it all over, um, you know, telling them to come. It's very appreciative. And the program is growing tremendously. Anybody who's watching the, the replay of this on YouTube, please click on the like button. Smash the like button or click on subscribe to Coach Menachem's channel so you get to um, see all the streams that come out every week. And again, we really appreciate that you come every week. So we'll start off first thanking all of our advertising sponsors, The Lakewood Scoop. I'd like a special thank you to Rabbi Anit for Chazak for promoting us on all the Chazak channels. We really appreciate it. Special thank you to Chayla Kaufman from JCN for always promoting us on all the Jewish platforms. We really appreciate it. I want to give also a special thank you tonight to a few people that helped in the background. Uh, Sasha Friedman, Sasha, Sasha Friedman from LA, who's a dating coach. She helped a lot with a lot of questions. She helped me before, and Menachem was going to add her to the email um, after the share. So anybody wants to contact anybody needs any help with the dating coach, she helped a lot. Also, a personal friend of mine, Suri Cohn, Mrs. Cohn, she helped a tremendous amount, put hours of effort going through, sifting through the questions, and trying to put them in some type of order so we could have some type of segment and try to go in that order. So I really appreciate that, and for everybody else that helped. Um, again, it shares every Sunday night at 10 o'clock. It's this time we cover various topics. Obviously, tonight is one of the more powerful topics. It's going to be uh, multiple shear, not just one. But um, we're going to start off with one tonight, and then we'll see when the next date is. We have tentatively for June 6th on a Sunday, but uh, we'll confirm with Rabbi Wawa if we do that. And also, I would like to um, say next week from 530, we're going to have an amazing program with Rabbi Daniel Blackstein. Um, next Sunday, we're going to be talking about taking the Torah mitzvahs to a more meaningful level. It should be an amazing program that everybody can join. It will be an amazing thing as well. So again, the Coach Menachem Show is collaborating with OK Clarity to, for greater health and wellness in the Jewish community of the globe. OK Clarity is the online platform for mental health support in the Jewish communities. Their online platform, you can find the best therapists, coaches, nutritionists, engaged in forums, and stay inspired. Links will be in the email on the show later after the show. Again, tonight we have the exclusive of having Rabbi Wawa Jacobson with us. Agree to come on and uh, tackle, try to tackle such a topic and try to give people some uh, guidance and help and uh, just really to have an open conversation. There's no magic answers, right? Well, you don't have the magic answer, right? Doesn't have the magic answer. So I'm letting everybody know if anybody thinks they came for the magic answer. Sorry, we're just here. be here for each other. We're just being here for each other, right? And um, I want to start off first with our host, Coach Menachem, to open it up tonight with the warm words. Coach Menachem actually just made a chasm this week. He just finished very brachas. So he's coming from Don Simcha. Coach Menachem, take it away. Shkoyev, shkoyev. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's get real with Coach Menachem, number 55, Bar Hashem. Yes, I did uh, go to the next stage in life, Bar Hashem, Mashavach Vaidar. I married off my oldest daughter. And uh, Hashem should continue to give Koyach and uh, help us all, whatever we need. To Amen. do the right thing. Amen. Amen. The truth is tonight's topic is a sensitive topic. And as much there is out there, organizations or therapists, there is still a lot of place where we can need, we can use a lot of help in this area. And um, for those who deal in this topic, know how hard it is sometimes you could hear a story and it sounds so real. And then you find out that it's just the opposite. And a lot of people get stuck. People don't know. And then you're talking about the world around you. It, it, looks, it looks one way and you're the only one who knows the truth. And you, you might try to tell it to somebody and uh, it, it doesn't work. Where do you go for support? Where do you go for help? How do you start? This is a, not an easy, not an easy topic. I personally know a story of somebody who was in a marriage for many, many years, thinking one way that the one of them needed help, and after many years, they found out that it wasn't the A, it was B that needed really the help. So it can be, it can get very sticky, and pretty hard for those who deal with it. So I guess we will start, and I'm sure it's not going to be a, a, a one-time thing. We'll have to do it more than once. But a little bit of putting things on the table, um, things that many times we don't want to talk about it. 
And uh, sometimes we say, let's not talk about it. Let's hope for the best. But it doesn't always work. If you can put it on the table, try to figure things out, even though it is painful, hopefully you can get some clarity, let some fresh air, fresh air in so that you can uh, figure things out with the right support, the right people. And sometimes you do get stuck with a therapist. It does happen and you have to go to a different one, but whatever it is to stay home and stay in your mind and hope for the best is not always the answer. So it's a big cover to have Rabbi Wawa tonight, a mission with us to give us the physic, the support to be with us together in this and a mitzvah Shem, get some clarity and, and, and a lot of siyata de shmaya. Thank you, Coach Menachem. Beautiful opening. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Oh, I think it's streaming now. I, I, I clicked on it. It should be working now. So I'm trying. Okay. Okay. Also tonight, before we start, we, got to, we, we have a bunch of topics. We put in order. I'm going to read through the topics. Part of the topics, a lot of the questions that came in was a lot of like technical things, courts and residents. So I reached out to a lawyer here in Lakewood. Uh, I thought it would be very helpful. She joined us here tonight. I'm going to read her a little bit of bio. And later when we get into those questions, um, she'll, she'll chime in. So I feel it will be uh, helpful for some of those type of questions. So I want to introduce her. her name is Mrs. Leah Lederberger. She's a divorce attorney. Since some of the questions and concerns tonight are regarding courts and Besden, she, gener she generously offered to be online tonight to answer some of those questions, those topics. Um, if you just didn't know who she is, she's, her name is Ms. Lederberger. She works at the Brown Law Firm right here in Lakewood. She has 16 years experience and knows the judges are about him. She knows the system very well. She also, she's a firm lady. She's the rear among divorce lawyers, you know, to have a regular firm lady. She relates to a lot of the pain and going on in the community. And her position is to glide to clients in Besden, the process well with the court system. She's litigated issues extensively and she's very well versed in the New Jersey Arbitration Act. And she also works very hard to make the PSAC Besden binding and enforceable just as a court judgment, which is a, a lot of questions came like that as well, which she'll address. Um, also, she, you know, she's familiar with a lot of from issues that you know, a lot of people are not familiar with. Three day M Taivim, things get very complicated. One mistake in a, in a court paper could, could equal thousands of dollars later down the road. So I feel that would be very helpful. And I heard from people, Ms. Lederberger, you know, she, she's, she's really out to help people. And I reached out to her and I told her what we're doing. She was, she was so happy. She felt that it was what she needs. She deals with so many people. And um, I'm just going to introduce her. She'll speak for just two, three minutes just to say who she is. And then we'll, she'll come back in when we get to the next topic. As I, I'll read through all the topics that we're going to go. So Mrs. Lederberger, if you're on, just you can say hello to everybody. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to compliment you on this really wonderful forum. Uh, what you put together here is amazing. Uh, we all know that everyone likes to give advice. Uh, not everyone is qualified to do that, you know, both from a therapy standpoint, from a legal standpoint. Um, and to someone going through the parsha, it gets very confusing. So I guess, you know, when you get to the court and based in topics, I hope I can help everyone listening tonight um, at least a little bit to get some clarity. Um, I just have to, you know, say a disclaimer that whatever we discuss is a legal advice, it's a discussion, very general terms. Um, and, you know, I hope uh, I can give some guidance in that manner. Thank you so much. We'll, 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 we'll uh, feel free to chime in on anything, but when it comes to that, we're definitely going to turn to you. So let me just give an overview of what we're trying to do here tonight. So it'll be a little different than normal. Uh, we basically narrowed down the process to nine main topics. Again, we're talking about life after divorce, which means from the time when people know that they're getting divorced, it doesn't mean they actually got to get or there's actually a divorce done. It's from the moment that people know that the marriage is over. We're not talking about if I should stay together, if I should not stay together. That's not the topic tonight. It's not what we're discussing. You know, I got text messages. Oh, you're promoting divorce. We're not promoting divorce. This is not about getting divorced. This is about once you're in it, the parsha. So I want to first op op open up with anybody who's watching this who's married. Obviously, you know, you're here tonight. And um, I think you could you could learn a lot to understanding all these topics. These are things that people that go through divorce uh, live through uh, for many years. And um, I think it's an amazing thing to watch and listen and could be supportive. I'm sure everybody has a family member or a very uh, close friend that's gone through it. So if you understand it, maybe you could be more supportive. Some of the questions that come in actually from friends and neighbors, how to deal with certain situations, which I think is a great topic to also discuss. Um, and for people that are going through hard times in marriages, the point of this year is you listen to everything and really realize you should really, really work much harder to make it work. So um, you don't have to deal with these things. Uh, this is actually should be a chizik to, to, to rebuilding your marriage stronger because it's not going to be pretty on the other side. And for the people that are going into this partial or in this partial or divorced, remarried, everything we're going to discuss tonight is somewhat relevant. You could definitely relate to a lot of it. So um, we took it from all angles. Let me just read through the topics and we're going to go in order of the topics. So let's start. The first topic we're going to talk about tonight is the initial hurt and the healing process from the beginning when somebody knows they're getting divorced, how to talk to people, how to deal with it, just the, the, the real, the emotional part. The second part, which usually 
comes after that is usually the fighting. It usually ends up in court or Besden, which Mrs. Letterberger will uh, chime in together for Rabbi YY. The third part, we, the third topic is going to be feeling abandoned by former family and friends, people that used to be neighbors of yours, or even, you know, your own family, your ex's family, how that plays in, you know, different areas. Feeling estranged from communities. Uh, this is a big topic. I'm, I've got a lot of questions on this, uh, a lot, mostly from men, but it's from women also. You know, people part of a community and all of a sudden they're divorced, they're outcasts, and all that. Next topic we're going to deal with is navigating your children's journey, which is a huge parasha. The next one is dealing with parental alienation. We have groups of literally uh, maybe over a thousand parents that are alienated from their children. Some are still married, but their children don't talk to them. But we're focusing on the ones from divorce, which is um, which is a very, very big topic. And uh, when we get to that, I'm sure that's going to be very important. The next topic is, uh, the, the, the hot topic is withholding the get. We got a few questions on that. The next topic we're going to be discussing is the appropriate time to explore dating and remarriage. And the last topic is navigating second marriages and the challenges of blending families, which is uh, probably going to be 10 shiurim in itself. But we're going to try to go in this order, Rabbi YY, and we'll try to cover at least one or two of them tonight. Um, and we'll keep on going through the series until we can cover ground. And we're trying to make it, again, interactive to help people, to make awareness, and to just be uh, supportive to everybody. So let's start with that. Again, we're going to probably do part two on Sunday, June 6th, Rabbi Waiwai. We'll confirm the dates afterwards. And Rabbi Waiwai, please give opening so we could uh, get warmed up and then take it from there. Thank you so, so much to my dear friend, Rabbi Usher, friends Rabbi Usher and Coach Menachem. And thank you to all of the hundreds or thousands of people who are joining us here this evening from so many different communities and demographics and backgrounds. But it's really moving to be able to be here together with really one objective. You know, I don't think any of us has the solution to all of life's challenges and problems, but we can be here together to hold each other's hands, to support each other, to be here for each other emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, socially. And that itself is incredible. And I want to express a special gratitude to Reb Usher and to Coach Menachem and to everybody involved, all of our sponsors, for really creating a platform, creating a platform that has one objective, to be able to unite Jews and to empower each other, to be able to say, Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazak. I want to share in the opening of this very sensitive topic, a beautiful insight that was shared by two people one from the world of Lita, the Litvisha world, and one from the world of the Chidusha world in Poland. The Shem Shmuel, Reb Shmuel Sochachover, son of the Avni Nezer, and Reb Chaim Shmulevich, the famous Miri Rosh Hashiva, Zechir Tzadikim Levracha. The Gemara says in Masech Shabbos, Daf Lamed Aleph Omid Beis, something fascinating and strange, that all of the years that the Jews wandered in the desert, for 40 years, it was as though they were in the same place. Why? Because Al Hashem Yisu, Al Hashem Yachino. Since they were guided by God, they were in the same place, and it's relevant to halacha. A discussion over there about Saiser, Al Manas Livnes Bim Kaimai, that when they took apart the Mishkan and they put it up somewhere else, it was like they're putting it up in the same place, because since God was guiding them, it was like as though they were stationed in the same geographical location for 40 years. And the commentators struggle. What does this mean? Sedrib Chaim Shmulevich, he gave a beautiful metaphor. He says, imagine a woman she's living in Be'er Sheva, and she needs to travel by bus. She gets on the bus. It's a hot summer day without an air condition in the bus, standing room only. You know, the bus is in Israel when people are in an anxious mood, and it's a hot, dry, sweaty day. And this woman gets in the bus from Be'er Sheva, and she goes to Yerushalayim. From Yerushalayim, she takes a bus to Tel Aviv, and then to Netanya, and then to Chadera, and to Petak Tikva, and then to Tzvas, and then Kiryat Shmona, all the way up north. And now she has to go all the way back afterwards, back to Be'er Sheva. You can imagine what a difficult day it was, my friends. But Reb Chaim said one more detail. She has a baby. She's holding on to a baby. He says, at the end of the day, if you ask this woman, in how many places, how many places were you today? She's like, Rebbeinah Shalaylam, don't even begin. 
it was a disaster. It was a catastrophe. One of the most difficult, stressful, anxious, hot, boiling, sweaty days of my life. Thank God I got home. He says, but if you would turn to the toddler, to the little infant in her arms, and so to speak, have a conversation with him and ask him, ask the baby, how many places were you in today? How many buses did you take? How many times did you get off the bus? How many times did you get onto the bus? How many times did you wait in the bus? How long did you wait in every bus station for the next bus? How many arguments and disputes did you have on the bus? The toddler would look at you and answer you, I was in the same space all day. I wasn't in many cities. I was in one place. I was in my mother's arms. Shadrach Chaim Shmulevich, and similarly the Shem Shmuel. This is what the Gemara means. Since I'll pee Hashem Yisu and I'll pee Hashem Yachanu, to make my dummy. The 40 years in the desert, the Jewish people felt that they are in the arms of the Rebbe Nishalon. The Gemara Rabbeinu says in Dvarim, Kasher Yisa of Ezbenoi, like a father or a mother carries a child, that's how they felt. So even if geographically, they were moving from one location to another location, to another location, to another location. That was only a physical, technical, geographical difference. But in terms of an emotional experience, they always felt that they were in the same space, cuddled, embraced, hugged, in the arms of their mother and father in heaven who loves them infinitely. In life, we are sometimes relocated from one space to another space. I don't only mean geographically, that too, but emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. And life is transformed overnight, radically. Especially when it comes to a divorce. I had a conversation a few days ago with a student of mine who went through a divorce, a difficult divorce. And he shared with me this, and this is what I want to leave you during with these introductory remarks. He told me the hardest thing was the sense of loneliness. He says, the first Friday night after the divorce, I'm alone in my apartment, sitting on the couch. There's no wife, there's no kids. I'm alone. The pain was so profound. I didn't have the courage or the interest or the willingness to invite myself out. I couldn't deal with it. I didn't want to go to anybody's house. I didn't want anybody's sympathy. I didn't want anybody's compassion. I was home alone. And he says to me, the boredom was so profound. The void was so deep. An Ehrlich an guy. He says, I have to tell you the truth. I opened up the television on Shabbos. I opened up the television on Shabbos. That was my only way to deal with it. I just had to distract myself completely. And he says, you have to understand, the religious community is built around marriage and family. And here I'm alone, without a marriage, without a family, Friday night. It was an emotional disaster. So I turned to him and I said, I was on the phone. What, say, what saved you? He said, you really have to develop a new and authentic and very deep relationship with your truest self and with God. At such a moment, this is for men and women, I'll pi Hashem Yisu, I'll pi Hashem Yachanu, to know that even if my life is a roller coaster, and I'm going through so many changes emotionally, and everything overnight has been transformed and metamorphosized. Everything has been transformed and metamorphosized. Nonetheless, I am cuddled up in Hashem's arms. Sometimes life is like a choo-choo train. You ever went on a choo-choo train? Dun, 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 dun. Sometimes life is like a roller coaster. But I'm in God's arms. When one is in in a very real and authentic relationship with Hashem. That's very personal. It's very intimate. It's not about social status or what other people know or think. He said, that empowers us and invigorates us that despite the vicissitudes and difficulties, we can always live and operate from a place 
of inner confidence as we're anchored in eternity. Thank you. What a beautiful opening. Okay, let's get into it. Let's take a poll. Let's get the oil warmed up and we're going to start again. The first topic is going to be the initial hurt and healing. Anybody who wants to ask a question, you could either under the reactions, you could raise your hand or you could text us the question. Obviously, live questions go first. We have, I, I never got Rabbi YY. My, my Gmail is, uh, I have to upgrade my account after this year. We've got hundreds of hundreds of questions um, because all the people that helped, we helped put it in some type of order and try to narrow it down. So let's take the poll. Let's get warmed up over here. Okay. Okay, everybody, again, it's anonymous. When you answer, nobody knows who's answering what. We just want to get a feeling, see what we're dealing with. The first question is, have you personally been divorced? Yes, no, I have someone close to me that's unfortunately divorced. Three options. Second question is, do you believe life after divorce is A, better? B, no, worse. B, worse than being, do you believe life after divorce is worse than being married? Or C, neither has changed one set of issues for another. It's basically switching your, your problems. Three, why do you think divorces are more common today than years ago? It's three options. Either people have more issues these days. B, people think life will be better off once they're divorced, not, not live. Life will be better off once they're divorced. Third option is people don't take responsibility for their actions. Three powerful questions. Please answer them. Rabbi, why, why we, can, we can get a feeling of what we're uh, dealing with here tonight. Please, yeah. Okay, five seconds. Is that nigga, maybe? Okay, five, four, three. Okay, here we go. Let's share with everybody. Okay, Rabbi, why, why, look at this. 55% of the people here tonight have personally been divorced already. So you're talking to a divorce crowd, which is great. Exactly, people should be here tonight. 28% of the people are no, and 70% of the people have somebody very close that, that, that unfortunately got divorced. Question number two, do you believe life after divorce is A, better, 41%, 10% worse than being married? 49% of the people feel that neither. It's changing one set of issues for another. Okay. Three, why do you think divorces are more common today than years ago? 26% of the people say people have more issues these days. 31% of the people say people think Life will be better once they're divorced. And the winning answer, 43%, people don't take responsibility for their actions. Very eye-opening uh, questions. Wow. Wow. Again, these are just opinions. I'm getting questions. Text. Okay. Every, okay. Before we start with the question, I just want to clarify a few things. We're talking very general terms. That's number one. There's obviously, everybody has personal stories. Everybody has their own ideas. We're, we're not trying to give one magic answer. It's just a sichas chaverim to discuss and to bring out topics and to talk about it. So there's nothing super personal. We're just trying to really give some guidance and talk. So we're going to start off first with the first question, and then we're going to take it from there, okay? First, again, yes. questions on initial pain and the hurt from when they realize they're getting divorced and their healing process. The first question is a very basic question we'll start with. My husband and I both agreed our marriage did not work out and decided together that we both wanted to get divorced. How do I tell my family my children, my friends, without getting into the details of the reasons behind the divorce, just to say that we're ending the marriage, Rabbi Wally. Yeah. It's a wonderful, it's, 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 it's a very good question. And I think I would suggest a few things. Number one, you know, people who are very close with you are obviously going to want to know why. So I, I, you know, I can't tell you what type of relationship you have with them, but if it's people who are really close to you, you know, they're going to ask you questions. They're going to want to know, did you discuss it with a professional? Did you get advice from good people? So I'm assuming that you did all that, that you really went through the process because we all know that divorce is sometimes a lifesaver. Sometimes it saved lives. Sometimes we could have done more or one of us could have done more. And the real issue with divorce is that we do it only with last resort and we feel that there's really no other alternative. And this is ultimately what's gonna to prove to be the best thing for the husband, for the wife, for the man, for the woman, for the children, etc. So they're gonna to wanna to know all these answers. And I'm not sure what your answer to that is. Did you really go through this process? It was just a decision you made with your your husband, but assuming you went through that responsible process of really talking to people who understand, who are objective, who are professional and experts in this area, who can help guide 
you and really see maybe there is room for introspection and growth and, and healing and repair. Maybe not, but maybe there is room. But assuming that, then I think it's important to have an open conversation with the people you want to have that conversation with. And you could share with them maybe that this is a personal decision you made. You did discuss it with some people who are real professional, and that's how you made this decision. But you have to realize that if I was your father or your mother, your brother, or your sister, I would right away wonder, are you really just following you know, instincts? And are there many blind spots? And are you really asking yourself the important questions? And do you really know what comes with divorce and realize that not everything is rosy? As somebody said, there were old challenges, but there's gonna be also new challenges. Did you really weigh all the pros and all the cons? So these are important questions that anybody who loves you and cares for you is going to ask. So the question is, why are you not sharing with them the details? Is it coming from strength or is it coming from weakness? Is it coming because you're trying to protect your spouse? The bottom line is that I think that your conversations have to be honest. Obviously, you want to share with people that which they can ultimately give you the feedback that will be helpful and not just people who are not really interested in you. But what I would generally guide you is that it's important not to be isolated. I think it's very important to have at least a few people with whom you really, really open. Just between you and your husband to decide yourself to get divorced, I don't know. I, I think that you need to, we all need feedback. Ain kavosh matirats, my person cannot get out of prison themselves. We all have blind spots. We all have biases. We all have our own insecurities and fears and traumas. We need feedback from somebody who's smart, who's caring, who's wise, who's perspective, who's, sen who's perceptive, who's sensitive to completely do this on your own without getting any advice and feedback and support before and during and after, I'm not sure is the wisest thing. But if you have that real support system, then you can tell the family members that, you know, please respect my privacy. There's a certain amount I want to talk about, a certain amount I don't want to talk about. But don't stonewall everybody you know in life and go into isolation because I don't think in short term or the long, long term, it's going to be good for you. How to break this to your children, how to share this with children. I think this is important. I'm not sure I should be giving that advice. I think it's important. There's books about this. There are seminars, there are professionals who, have, who are real experts in this area. How do you share this with children in a way that doesn't destroy them and break them, helps usher them in in the best way possible to this new reality? So do that, follow that but get a person or people who are really, really good at this and who their advice resonates with you. Just a follow up, if it's somebody they don't wanna answer, what's a strong way they can tell somebody this is where we are? Right, so, you know, again, if it's somebody who a stranger you don't wanna answer, you could just say, you know, somebody, an acquaintance from Shul or the supermarket or school, you, know, you could say, I'm not really comfortable talking about it, but thank you for your concern. If it's somebody closer, really closer to you, the question is, you really don't wanna say anything, you can't say anything, is there a dysfunctional relationship here? Are you scared they're gonna judge you? They're gonna drive you crazy? I don't know, but generally, boundaries are important in all conversations. You know, I may tell somebody, this is really a very personal and private issue and I'm not ready to discuss it. I'm not ready to explore it. And thank you for respecting, you know, my boundaries and thank you for your friendship and thank you for your concern. I mean, that's a very respectful way of telling somebody it's, you know, it's not just about me. It's about somebody else. And I'm not ready right now to explore it with you. Um, you could say that to somebody. I don't see that to be disrespectful or offensive. Again, the question is, is there a toxic relationship here? And then will they only drive you more crazy? Mm -hmm. So then you really need help in creating some boundaries with them. Very good. The next question that came in is, during my marriage, so much of my life was centered around my children. Now that I'm divorced, I have much less time with my children and my life feels more empty and less meaningful. How can I find meaning in my life with so little involvement as a parent in the lives of my children? That's, uh, that's an important question. Thank you. And I think there's certainly a void that is created. Life changes. 
you're a mother or a father every night with children, and if you're sharing custody, if it's 50-50, you know, you have more time on your hands. The house is quiet. Sometimes Shabbos, Yom Tif, you can't. It's absolute silence, and everything changes. And this is so important, two points, I would say, three points. Number one, it's a time not to become surrender to despair, which is easy. It's very easy to surrender to despair and feel like I'm a victim and I'm a failure and my life is over. For this, it's so important to be able to anchor yourself in a deep relationship with your soul and with Hashem, as I said before, and realize that there is a real north. It's not old south. There's a real north that God really, really has your back. And that every day is an opportunity for new awareness, for growth. Use this time for introspection. Use this time for inner growth. Use this time to become the greatest person you can become. And the time that you have now on your hands, I would get involved in something. Maybe get involved with a project, with an organization, with a movement. Create something. Find a mission. Find a passion where what you are passionate about meets something that the world or the community really needs and get involved in that. Do not just allow your days and nights to be squandered. Nurture yourself, nurture your body, nurture your soul. Be involved in a hobby that is meaningful. It's very important not to enter into a place of despondency, both in terms of your schedule and in terms of your spiritual mood. And it's also important to be able to have people that you speak to. It's natural to go into isolation and feel nobody understands me. That's po it's possible. Many people will not understand you. And by the way, I want you to know a few friends asked me if they should come on tonight. They're married and they have good marriage. A, a, a close friend of mine said, should I watch this with my wife tonight? What, what do you call it, Usher? Burn flicks, burn flicks. What, what is it called? Burn flicks. We're, burn. we're going public next week. So he... It's a public stock. So he's, he has a good marriage, very good marriage. So I said, you should come on. I'll tell you why you should come on. You should come on to understand a little bit what people want, get divorced are going through. People have to understand. It's very important. To the best of our ability, you can't fully understand, but at least to listen. So it's important to find somebody, one, two, three people who are wise, who are kind, who get it to be able to talk openly and vulnerably about your journey. The next question, I believe that's why I'm jumping in, at least exactly what we're saying, it was actually written by a very good friend of mine, he specifically wanted me to ask you the question so people understand the feeling. As divorcees, sometimes we feel all alone. A divorcee is in essence a Rahmanus, like a widow or an orphan. It's not what, that, what I want to be called a Rahmanus, but just it should be recognized that we need extra help from the community. Why do we always have to put up a strong, solid face that everything is okay? With a widow or other tra tragedies, the entire community is there to help. But I have yet to hear from any, ra I don't know if a rabbi, anybody promoting to help our, out divorces. Because unfortunately, our community divorce is always associated with some type of scandalous bad thing. It's looked at as negatively. Versus yeah. Never. Let me be there for that. Yeah. yeah. So let me try to be very real and very authentic with you. We live in societies where we are judged. There are people who judge us. That people who judge married people, if you get married late, you're judged. If you get married early, you're judged. If you get divorced, you're judged, right? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Your girl marries this one, you're judged. Your boy marries this one, you're judged. You're sent to this yeshiva. Right, right, right. Point, it's perfect. They judge something so wrong over there. They look so, they look so perfect. <laughs> and, and then, and then it's, and at some point in life, my dearest friends, you know, let's be very honest and Cut to the chase. At some point in life, you have to tell yourself, I'm not going to be living for other people. I'm just not going to do it anymore. They once asked a 106-year-old woman, what's the advantage of living so long? She said, less peer pressure. At some point in life, you have to be true to yourself. You and I and all of us need to develop a real, authentic relationship with Hashem that is unbreakable, that is indestructible. Yes, are the people who make comments? Yeah. Are the people who are clueless? There are plenty of people who are clueless. But as long as you're confident and you're anchored 
in a very powerful connection with your creator, with your core consciousness, with your deepest spiritual essence, you'll be fine. Are these the people that you're going to become best friends with? No. But it's so important to have one or two or three people. I want to tell you something. I have a student who went through a divorce. It was a difficult story, a difficult situation. Something happened to him in his youth and it affected him in a very devastating way. And as a result of that, the marriage didn't work out. They got divorced after having a few children. He would call me for advice around once a week. And I would give him advice. Very intelligent fellow. I was frank. I was blunt. I was open. He told me recently after many years, he said, I just want to tell you, there was so often I did not want to follow your advice. Why? I was angry. I wanted to take revenge. I just wanted to let out steam. I was too lazy. I was too depressed. I was too vengeful. I didn't, I really did not want to take your advice. But since I knew that you mean you are trying to think about what is best for me and my future and my children, what will be the best thing? And I respected your wisdom. I respected your friendship. I respected your integrity. Therefore, 99% of the time I followed your advice. And afterwards, I was so thankful. I was so grateful. So I want to tell all of us, it's, it's a difficult situation. You have to acknowledge it. And there's grief and there's pain. And there are a lot of tears. And you have to have compassion for all these emotions. And there are people who don't understand. They really don't understand. And yes, there are people who judge. There are people who judge. There are people who are clueless. Not everybody. Some people are very kind and understanding. But they could still be clueless. We have all different types of people. But what I'm encouraging you is you become comfortable with yourself. And when you're comfortable with yourself, trust me, we all sense when somebody is comfortable with themselves and we gravitate to them. <laughs> you give yourself the love that you need and you will find those people, those quality people who you could create real connections with. And it's important to find that one, two, three people, that one or two, one person or two people or three people, if you're lucky, who get it, who have good marriages, or who are very wise, who are not miserable, who are not guiding you down a path which is detrimental for you just because of their own issues. You know, very, 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 you want to be people who are operating from a place of inner wholesomeness and health. And those are the people you talk to, you get advice from, and you connect. And you know what? We all need to create awareness in our community about a lot of things. One of it is this, the state of divorce people you know, don't stigmatize people and don't judge them and don't right away associate nastiness. You really don't know anything. You know, we don't know anything. So Asama says, says in Pirkei Ovis, don't judge anybody till you reach their space. And he says, and you'll never reach their space. We all need that humility and get rid of the stigmas and be much more compassionate and much more open and much more understanding. And you know what? Part of this evening is to create that type of awareness for all of us. He wants us. me to go live. Well, it, okay. All right, Rabbi, we're going to take a live question, okay? Um, again, anybody's going to want to ask live, we're just, Mr. Gutman, we're talking only about the initial hurt and the healing process. Let's cover that topic, so you go. It's not really a question. It's just, <clears throat> I want to continue what we're talking now. We go to shul. I need to use my energy as a divorcee. I need to use my energy for a lot of things. As we said, we need to, we're in grief. Once we make peace of it, we go to shul. Everybody in shul talks about it. You know people are talking about you behind. How do we block out the people that do judge? It's more of a, when you hear somebody, because it's always a scandal, there's a reason, oh, he got divorced, he's a Rahmanas. We're not a Rahmanas. Usually, if we work on ourselves, we come out stronger and better, as you saw in the poll. Most of the people answered, life after divorce is much better. So, and no pun intended, but I need more of a chizik of saying, how do I judge out the bad people, the people that just bring a negativity into your life and just continue going about your business. You go to shul, you daven, you want to connect Hashem. And as you mentioned before, we make mistakes, we fall down. How do I get myself up knowing that I did a mistake 
and say, you know what, I'm in a bad position, but I want to grow. I want to become closer to him. Beautiful, beautiful question. You're a precious young man. You're small. So I'm going to share with you and with all of you an incredible insight of the Maharshal. The Maharshal was one of the greatest Paisk and greatest halachic authorities in the 16th century in Poland. He was a Rosh Hashiva and the Rav of Lublin, among many other cities. Rav Shloim Aluri is known as the Maharshal. He passed away in the 1500s, 1570s. And the Maharshal writes in Yam Shal Shloima, Mesechus Ksuvus, he says something incredible. Why do we break a glass under the chuppah? Usher, listen to this. Why do we break a glass onto the chuppah? You hear? So everybody says, you're Shalayim, Beis HaMikdash, we're in Golos. Right? That's why we break the glass. You know what the marshal says? You know we break the glass under the chuppah? I saw this the first time. I'm like, whoa. He says, because at the first chuppah in history between Hashem and the Jewish people, Matan Torah Har Sinai. You know what happened? Moshe broke the luchas. Forty days later, he broke the tablets. He broke the luchas. That's why we break the glass under the chuppah. And I'm looking at this Maharshal. This is Maharshal. Maharshal was considered one of the greatest authorities, and this is the 1500s. Not a new word. Every chuppah, we're trying to remember the broken luchas. Why? I know Moshe broke the luchas. It was a horrible tragedy. They built the calf and he broke the luchas. Why do we have to do it under the chuppah? Marshal says we have to remember that's what happened there. And I think perhaps one of the messages that he's telling us is you're getting married now. We hope that this marriage is blissful. Happily married ever, forever after and the honeymoon never ends. But you know what? Life breaks all people. And then some of us know how to live in broken places better than others. The greatest marriage between Hashem and the Jewish people also broke. And the luchas broke. And the question is, what do you do with the broken pieces? And the marshal is telling you, there's going to be broken glass. Will you have the courage to be able to say mazel tov and pick up the fragments and put them in the arun? In the Kedush HaKadoshim, because as the Gemara says about Babatsu Yadala, the Luchas and the broken Luchas were all in the Aram. They all made up, made up the Holy of Holies. And I say to you, you go to Shul, there are people who talk, there are people who analyze, there are people who are dissect. But you be authentic. Be authentic to your vulnerability. Be authentic to your pain. Yes, there's brokenness, and we need to grieve, and we need to weep. We need to cry, and sometimes we sob. But there's a lot of healing. You have to respect everything you're going through. You have to have compassion for your emotions. But if you could be honest with all of your emotions and then say, I am going to use these broken luchas to create a new aren, to create a new kaitesh hakadashim, then ultimately the distractions, the static from people who just don't get it, becomes less and less relevant. You could feel the pain, and that's fine. But it becomes less and less relevant. Because you know why? There are real people. And real people look for truth, and they see it. If you come to Shul, and you really come to Shul to connect with God, and to connect with people in a real way, there's an energy that you will exude, just like we all felt your energy right now. And all real people will right away sense it and feel it. And people who are more petty and primitive, okay, you know, they, they do their thing and ultimately it becomes, it becomes so insignificant and irrelevant. So when you're really preoccupied with nurturing your soul, with growing every single day, with being vulnerable and open and honest and authentic with yourself and with your real friends and with your real teachers and with Hashem himself, I guarantee you that the less and less you will even notice this noise because really it's just noise. It has no substance. It has nothing, nothing real to it. I remember I once asked Rabbi Adin Steinsaltz passed away a few months ago, Rabbi Adin Evan Yisrael, so I asked him, you know, I said, I, I travel around. This was a few years ago. I travel around the world. 
And sometimes people give real harsh criticism. You know, they give real criticism. You said this, you didn't say this. So uh, I said, how do you, how do you, how do you, how, how should I deal with it? So he said, listen, if you're getting criticism from somebody whose opinions you'll never even hear about. If you, he said, if you have a question or problem in life, will you consult these individuals? I said, not really. He says, okay. He says, you need to get the feedback from those individuals with whom you would consult with about your biggest problems in life. He says, that's who you need feedback from. And that feedback you should respect. People whose opinions, they're fine. You don't have to judge them. Everybody is in their own journey. Everybody's in their own place. Remember one more thing, Rabbi Shmuel. Whenever people speak about other people, this is so true, they're not speaking about other people. They're speaking about themselves. When you point a finger at somebody, you're pointing three fingers at yourself. In Yiddish, when you say he cursed, we never talk about other people. We always talk about ourselves. Because even when we're talking about other people, we're just talking about ourselves. So remember, everybody who's judging you is just talking about you, but it's just a projection of themselves. The more you realize that, you'll be a free man. Very good. The question, next question is really what you just, you mentioned before, a very important piece is the relationship between you and Hashem. But this is um, after what happened to someone. How do I? How do you understand and accept that Hashem wanted this? And and, and it continues. How do you swallow the fact that your former spouse looks like an erlichid, beard and payas, and acts like like uh, nothing is wrong with him? But you know that he behaves in a does many averes and uh, busy transgressing on a regular basis. Even more than that. I worry like crazy that my kids will follow in his footsteps and not realize that he's a faker since I can't say anything to them about him. Where, where, where do we go with this? Yeah. First of all, I'm here with you. It's, it's, it's very hard. It's very difficult. Your concerns are real. The pain is real. The, the double, the, the, the fakeness, the deception, the lie. Sometimes we look at somebody, we know the inner story, you know? Nobody else knows the inner story. And it's, it's, it's very painful. And I think really this is where it is so, so important again and again for you to be able to be anchored in a very deep spiritual space. Because we can't live other people's lives and we can't waste our time living in the world of resentment. As a wise person once said, living in a world of resentment is basically putting myself on fire and hoping that my enemy inhales the smoke. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's I eat the poison. And I hope that my enemy will somehow get affected by it. So it's natural to feel this resentment. And, you know, a part of me or part of you wants to go to the roof of the shul and scream, do you know who this guy is? But he's your parents, he's your children's father. And you respect that. And you know that ultimately your children need a relationship with their mother and father. And you don't want to badmouth him to your children, which is very, very noble. It's very normal. So realize that this is part of your journey and it's an opportunity for you to really grow. But don't amputate these emotions. Learn from them. All of our stress and anxiety and resentment and negativity and jealousy deep down are really just an alarm clock that are waking us up to things with inside of us. What is the pain I'm experiencing? What is the loneliness I'm experiencing? The injustice the, the lack of fairness. These are all emotions that you have to respect and, and, and explore them. Explore them with somebody who cares for you, somebody who cherishes you, whether it's a confidant, a friend, a rabbi, a rabbi, a mashpia, a therapist, a coach, a psychologist, whatever it is, it's important to be able to, to grieve, to be able to experience this, but also then to realize 
that your life is your life and his life is his life. You take responsibility for your life. You cannot allow his fakeness or his brokenness or his issues to ruin your life. You're too good. You're too holy. You're too divine. And you know what? He's on his journey and hopefully one day he'll be able to find his own soul and transform himself and live a real life. And there's, a, there's compassion here for him also. In, in what type of gullus is he living? You know, you could lie to the whole world. You can't lie to God. You can't lie to the person who's looking back at you in the mirror. You know, I could lie to the whole world. <laughs> Almost to the whole world. But the person looking back in the mirror, you know, he knows the truth. So how much pain is he in? How many cover-ups? No, but he's living a life of cover-ups. You, you, you celebrate the fact that you could be honest, and you could be real, and you can have a real relationship with the Rebbein Shalom. I'm going to share with you an unbelievable word from the Baal Shem Tov. He says, it's in Er HaMeir. Er HaMeir is written by Reb Wolf of Zhitomer, and he says, the whole first chapter of the Megillah is how Achashverosh summons Vashti, and she doesn't want to come. So the Gemara says the Megillah, he wanted her to come without clothes, and she didn't want to come without clothes, so he has her killed. So the Baal Shem Tov says there's a very deep spiritual story here. Achashverosh, Chazal say, is a metaphor for Hashem. Acharis, Veracious, Shaloi. It's a combination of three words. The end and the beginning is his. Vashti is a metaphor for duality, shtei, klipa, unholiness. He says, in life, there comes a time where Hashem summons you to stand before him. And you want to show up. He says, no, 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 without clothes, without cover-ups, without facades, without masks. I want to see you. I want your honest, vulnerable, real heart and soul and mind. I want to see raw, 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 naked. You know what happens to Vashti? Hashem says she ceases to exist. She just dies. You know why? Because for her cover-up, cover-up was her life. It was literally, to paraphrase, she was, an, she was clothes without an emperor. <laughs> there's an emperor without clothes. There's clothes without an emperor. Some people, all they have to themselves is clothes. There's nothing inside. So when Hashem says, take off the clothes, there's nothing left. How thankful you should be for the fact that when the layers are removed, there's something real there. Cherish that and live with that and celebrate it because that's real. That's the only thing that survives everything. Look at all the systems in the world that are based on cover-ups, you know, Ponzi schemes. What's a Ponzi scheme? You know, Bernie Madoff just died right a few weeks ago. This Ponza, what is it? It's basically, it's an illusion. It's a lot of, lot of clothes. It's Vashti's clothes, but there's nothing inside. There's nothing inside. So yes, it's, it's, it's painful to watch, but be so thankful that you're, you're in a different place and, and pray for him. I would pray for him. What do we do with the relationship to Hashem for those who feel? It's hard, listen. People get angry at Hashem. People get upset. Why do you do this to me? You know, I, I was a, I'm a good, I was a, trying to be a good to Yiddish mama or a good to Yiddish tata, whatever the situation is. I have my serious nefesh for my marriage. Some people worked on their marriage for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, five years, whatever it is. And sometimes you're dealing with serious mental illness or serious trauma or mood disorder or personality disorder or whatever it is. And they tried everything. And, and you suffered and you did it all for your kinderlach, for the two, three, four, five, six, seven kids, whatever it is. And then it all falls apart. And they're blaming you, right? And they're blaming you. And, and, and you blame God. You blame God. And again, I would say to you, have compassion for all your emotions. Do not deny your emotions. Don't judge yourself. And don't get into this place of guilt, of endless guilt, you know, I'm guilty, I'm bad, I could have done this, I could have done that, I could have done that, because that's coming from the Yitzhahara, and it wants to keep you down and crushed and depressed and melancholy. Be very honest with Hashem. You can talk to Hashem like you talk to a best friend. Tell Hashem everything, everything, including what you think about him. Don't worry, he's not afraid. Be honest, be vulnerable, be real, be authentic. Say it as is. If you have to scream, scream. If you have to cry, cry. If you want to laugh, laugh. But be, be very honest. Be very open. 
bring your whole pain to Hashem. Bring your whole stress, everything. Bring, bring it into the relationship. Be fully, fully present there. Because as the Gemara says in Yuma Samachtas, ugly truth is much, much better than beautiful lies. The Gemara says in Yuma Samachtas that Daniel and Yermia would not say the words Hagibar and Hanoira on Hashem. He's powerful and he's awesome. You know why? Because they saw the destruction of the Beis Hamidosh and they said, where is his power? Where is his awesomeness? Frek the Gemara, how can they do this? Moshe says, give me a venayna. They knew that the definition of Hashem first and foremost is truthfulness. And therefore they would not say something that for them is a lie. And you have me of the same word. Shami says, they knew that God hates flattery more than anything else. I'm just going to... Don't flatter him. Tell him exactly who you are, where you are, what your feelings. And you know what? From that authentic relationship, you will see. You're going to reach a deeper place of connection and a deeper place of love and a deeper place of awareness. And you may not be able to answer the question of why this happened. We really don't have an answer why. Why do people go through all this pain? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. But what you will be able to find in God is support to empower you to take the broken luchos. Your luchos were broken. Your tablets were broken. A marriage is sacred. By Jews, a marriage is sacred. And those luchos, that contact, that bond was broken. And Moshe was the one who broke them. And Hashem didn't tell him to break the luchos. This is something Moshe did on his own. And it's the last words of Rashi on the whole Torah. Yasher koichasa sheshi barta. Why? Because Moshe's greatest accomplishment was to teach the Jewish people how to take their brokenness and transform it into a force and a catalyst and a springboard for unprecedented growth and awareness and transformation and renewal. Wow. Okay, anybody again, anybody else wants to ask on this specific topic, the initial hurt in the healing process? I have one more question for Rabbi Huawei and there's a few live ones. So anybody else wants to ask on this specific topic, please text me quickly because we're gonna start moving on to the second topic. Okay, you're on live, so you can ask, go. Okay, uh, hi. Um, wow, first of all, thank you so much, Rabbi Huawei. Um, um, I, I have a different take on it. So people talk, everybody's talking about pain, but my uh, the, the woman that, I'm, that I speak to, and myself personally, I'm so grateful to be divorced from my ex. Wow. What, like when, 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 you know, when we were dating before we were married, everything was great, but it quickly, it felt like I was raising our children on our own. Right. And I'm the breadwinner and I'm taking care of the home and I'm social. And my ex is just weighed us all down and I won't go into the details and the bailouts and whatever. I'm grateful. I got my get and he sees the kids whenever he wants, but I'm not in pain. And I'm being judged because people think I should be. What's wrong with not being in pain? Listen, I, I, I would never, I, I don't understand why somebody would judge you for not being in pain. I am grateful that you're not in pain. I am grateful that you can move on with your life and he can move on with your life and that the children are getting you know, the best possible life that they can get and that you feel emancipated and you feel very grateful that you got the get and so forth. So I don't think there's any reason to judge anybody for not being broken and not being in pain. That's amazing, that's awesome, that's, that's just wonderful. The only thing I would encourage you is, you know, just to be able to become, to always be aware of your perspective and to be aware of the perspective of your children because he is their father. And sometimes I think it's just important for all of us to remember that our opinions about our ex may be very, very different than the opinion of our children about our ex because it's their mother or their father. And it's so important to create space for that and to respect that. And I would just also just mention one more detail. And that is, it's just extremely important to realize that even if you're grateful, and I'm, I'm very happy you're grateful, but you can understand that there are many people for whom even if they're grateful that they got to get, there's also a sense of grief and a sense of loss because they invested so much in this marriage. They had children together. They're always gonna be connected through their children. 
and they feel a very profound grief. And it doesn't contradict the fact that they think it was the right thing. So I don't think anybody should really feel guilty. You know, somebody is grieving. Somebody doesn't feel that they have to grieve. Somebody is so overwhelmed from joy and grateful for it. You know, great. It's just very important to be able to respect our own emotions, to respect other people's emotions, and to be able to respect the process of moving on and to do it with a dignity to everybody involved, ourselves, the other one, and our children, of course. So thank you for sharing that. Rabbi, well, there's another live question. Let's uh, let's get to it. Sure. Um, unmute yourself. Okay, you're on. I'm on? You are. Okay, I haven't... I think it's a pretty general question. Um, when two people get divorced, obviously they didn't get along in the marriage. And when there's children, it becomes a respect issue. Now, I really don't want to go down that road. But unfortunately, in the from community, most divorces with children end up like in a tragic battle. And the children are the ones that suffer. Um, I don't understand with all the respect that's trying, that's like, we try to instill in our children. Really, it's a huge issue that Askanim try to be the do-gooders and pump a huge disrespect from, you know, to the parent that's being fought or I don't even know how to like phrase it properly. Like, you know, they have different views and they're getting divorced and now, they're going to instigate or alienate the children against the other parent. I really, I'm not getting an understanding why this is really something only in the from community. I do have a lot of relationships with people outside the from community or not even a Jewish at all that are divorced. They're co-parenting. Like the children are not an issue. Why in the world, in our community, do the children have to become pawns on a ch in a chess game instead of like just raising your children like in a respectful way? You know, mommy and Tati didn't get along, so we're living in separate houses and you're living with mommy and you go to Tati and he's a phenomenal Excellent. father and we just couldn't get along, but you have the right to love him you have the right to love me and raise healthy children. I've seen it, honestly, time and time again, but, but very little. Like not enough of this is seen in our community. Right. Rabbi, it's a great question. It's, we, we're going to get so deep into that, which is going to do the nation and everything. You can answer, but I, I don't want to get deep into it because we have so many questions exactly where she's going. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's so, so important to state this, I guess a thousand times you can't state it enough. And that is, we're getting divorced, but our children has to be the priority. They did not ask for their parents to get divorced. So any decisions that we make always have to be with the utmost sensitivity of how it's going to impact our children. And that is so, so important. What happens to so many of us is our attitude is I'm looking for justice. I'm looking for fairness. I want to get my revenge. My spouse is crazy. He's a mishugana. He's narcissistic. She's mentally ill. I'm going to bury her. I'm going to bury him. Whatever that attitude is. So we destroy ourselves. <laughs> we destroy our ex. And most importantly, we destroy our most precious, our, 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 our beloved children in the process. And people don't realize they get so overwhelmed with zealousness and with vengeance and with impulsiveness. And then they bring in God and Yiddishkeit and Torah and mitzvahs and yeshivas and, and, and the families get torn apart and this side is with this side and this side is with that side. It's so important 
to keep our eye on the objective. And that is, we have here little children who didn't ask for this divorce. They were brought into the world. The minimal, we, we're getting the voice. We have feel we have to get the voice. But the minimal we can do is respect each other so that we can both give our children the best chance at having a future. And I don't know what the word is, beg, but I think we all have to look deep into ourselves, even if you are so upset with your spouse and for good reason, and you're angry and you're full of rage and resentment and you felt that you suffered so much including during the divorce and it's still not over i get it i get it but you want to you want to lose the battle in order to win the war don't get caught up in the petty narratives and the agenda of i'm gonna win you i'm gonna destroy you and our kids become missiles literally missiles, I hate to use the word, human shields in our dysfunctional ability to be able to see the bigger picture. But if we could respect each other and we could do it in a civil, peaceful, normal way and in a way that the children can realize this is their father, this is their mother who did not get along but mommy and Tati will love you both and give you the best life possible and we could communicate in that fashion there's no words to describe how much goodness could come out from such an attitude for the children. So yes, I, I can't agree with you more. What, what should one do if their spouse is out there to get them? I mean, that's such a hard one. If your spouse is out there to get you, if your spouse is out. So of course, we always want to ask ourselves, is there somebody who can talk to him? Is there somebody who can talk to her? Is there somebody who can get involved? You know, a mensch, a barda, somebody who's who cares, who takes responsibility. Again, not somebody who's going to, you know, become part of the problem. Somebody who's going to be part of the solution. We always want to seek that path. You know, could somebody explain to the person, enlighten the person? This is not about revenge. There's something much bigger here. There's something much larger here. There's something that is at stake that is really eternal and timeless. And the reason you're so upset at each other is partially because of your children. So why are you going to harm? There's an expression somebody once wrote, you know, we harm that which we love most. You know, that which you love most, you destroy. You know, you love them so much and, and you're going to destroy them in the name of love. So that's always the first step. If that's not happening, you know, if, if, if there's nothing you can do, in other words, sometimes people are suffering from a terrible mental illness. Really, you know, frankly, I mean, I have a student who got divorced and there was a terrible, terrible mental illness over there. And I asked him what he did. He, I mean, he shared this with me. And he said, he said, Rabbi Jacobson, I'll be very honest with you. I knew that she is going to be a mother according to her capabilities. She would have kept me in court for 30 years. This woman would have kept me in court for 30 years. And I called her and I said, you know what? I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting. I didn't want to schlep my kids to court. You have the children. And he said, I had really no choice. If I felt my kids were in danger, of course, I would have to do whatever I have to do. But I didn't feel they were in danger. But I felt that she is, she has her serious, serious problems. But the alternative would have been endless, endless fighting. He said, I told her, do what you want. Let's keep the children safe. And then I want to tell you something else he did something brilliant. His, his spouse was spewing venom about him. He doesn't come to see you. He does. She didn't let him come see him. He doesn't come to see you. He doesn't care about you. He hates you. You know what he did? Listen to this. And it can work both ways. I'm, not, uh, I'm just telling you a story, but it can work also, of course, the other way. He was not seeing his children. He was not connected to his children. And she was blaming him because of her, her deep, deep challenges. He said, I never said anything bad about their mother, ever. Even when I had a chance to speak to them, ever. I did not want to do that. He says, I never bad-mouthed her, but this is what I did. I created an email account for each one of my children, seven children, an email account. Every day, every few days, I would send these children an email. They didn't, they didn't have access to, she wouldn't give them access to my letters. 
but I created an email account with my password for them. I went to the zoo. I would take a selfie of me with the lioness, send it to the email, David, I'm thinking about you. I love you. I wish you were here with me in the zoo. I went to the ice cream shop. I wish you were here and I could buy you an ice cream. He said, I did this almost every day and I sent emails to the children. You know what happened, he tells me? These kids become 16 and 17. And then they come to Tati and they say, why did you abandon us for 10 years? Why do you never come visit? Why do you never take us for Shabbos? And I say, my malach, here is the password to your email. And they go into their email. And they see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails. Love, letters, encouragement, birthday wishes, experiences in life. And nobody could make them up. It's going back 10 years. He said, and I got each one of my children back. Because they realized in a moment that all the venom was a lie. It was a lie. He said, I said, and you were silent for all these years? He said, yeah. My only alternative was that the fighting would be nonstop. I was not ready to do that for my kids. For my kids, I was not ready to do that. To say, you know, you cannot tell somebody what to do. These are things are so difficult. But what I would say, get real, real advice from real experts who think about the children. Real advice. I'm not talking about people who don't understand. Real advice from people who will understand what will be the best thing for the children. And realize you're not here to be victorious. You're not here to teach her or him a lesson. You're not here to gain justice. Leave that for God. You know, we say by the Seder, Shvaich. I was once running a public Seder. <laughs> so somebody gets a very liberal, liberal person, liberal Jew gets up. I don't like this. We open the door for Elijah and we say, Shvaich HaMoschel HaGoyim. You know what that means in English? Pour down your wrath on all the Gentiles who don't know you. Come on, why so much violence? I said, my dearest friends, this is such a beautiful prayer. We tell God, listen, I don't want to fight Hamas. I don't want to fight Zabala. I don't want to fight Iran. I want to be a lover. <laughs> you, you pour down your wrath on terrorists, on killers, on murderers who send 4,000 rockets. You do it. I don't want to be involved. I say to you, let God exact payment in criminals. Your focus has to be, how am I going to make my life and my children's life the best life possible. But there is anger. There is anger. And it gets overwhelming. And you know what he did. And you know him. And you want to get him back. Or you want to get our back. But it's so important to have real people who are guiding you in this process, my dearest friends. And if I uh, can add uh, something to what Rabbi YY said, um, you know, while sometimes it's advantageous to the children, you know, for a parent to take a back seat and then ultimately reassure the children of their love, you know, of that non-custodial parent's love for them. Sometimes it really is best for the children to have the non-custodial parent's ongoing love and involvement in their life. Um, you know, every situation is different, obviously. Um, so I've seen that it's always better um, in, in situations where there's alienation or for some reason children are being kept from the non-custodial spouse. Um, you know, to, to fight back strongly and right away um, because, you know, you, you cut to the chase. If you have a good attorney or a, a, a good towing, um, you fight back quickly um, and uh, try not to protract the litigation. And it could work. And in New Jersey, it really could work. Um, you get your custody expert and, you know, you go for it and uh, your children will benefit in the, wrong, in the long run. I just want to add one more thing to what she's saying. I, I do find this by a lot of people that they, they get divorced, they get in that toll the first few months or the first six months, and one parent grabs the custody. And it's not that the other person doesn't want to have the custody, they're more than just like they're patumult and they're in a weaker state. And then there's a famous saying that gets that you get to swallow in court. It's called status quo. And once it comes to that status quo, you you sort of like <laughs> pretty much you're pretty stuck. So which I think what Mrs. Letterberger is trying to really emphasize is important is the more you leave the kids in that other parents care for long periods of time, 
it's like a proof that that's what you're holding. So just act fast and don't don't sleep on it. That's just that, you know from that point of view. Yeah. Okay, I, again, I, I want to say on topic. Oh, sorry. No, no, finish up. Sorry. Yeah. If 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 there was never an issue um, with a non-custodial uh, spouse's relationship with the child, if that person does wait and the new status quo is created, now there could have been you know now there's an issue. Um, and that's a real shame for someone that wants to fight for a good relationship with their children. You should act quickly. Okay, thank you. Let's just take one more question with this topic because I see it's already starting to slip, slip through other topics. Let's just finish the last topic again of the initial hurt and healing process and then we're gonna move on to the, to the next part. Um, it's a very powerful question and um, it's a different angle. Our marriage collapsed over the last few years. There was a tremendous amount of betrayal, fighting pain and hurt, especially towards the end. Now that we finally ended our marriage and the eye of the storm of the fight has calmed down, I'm feeling huge amounts of pain and anger and even hatred. At the end of the day, I want to move on for myself. Please, Rabbi Jacobson, how do I move on? How do I forgive and let go of all the pain, hurt, and anger for myself in a therapeutic way and also in a terroristic way? Also, how do I accept the last 10 years of my life together with this person, the symptoms that we shared together, the love that we had together? It's all gone. It's like a chunk of my life is like delete. Wow, wow, wow. This is, this is a very, very important question. And, you know, this is where we come back to grief, to the idea of grieving. Almost every relationship, not every, but almost every relationship has some good parts to it. And now I lost it. I lost a certain status in life. I lost a certain connection. I lost a certain relationship. I lost a certain standing in my community. There is loneliness, even if there was a bad marriage. There was a Shabbos table. There were guests. My kids had two parents. And it's so important to give myself the dignity and the time to grieve, to heal. This is so important. And, you know, even, even if it's a point, sometimes a person says, I realize they left because of me. Even if I'm ready to say that, you know, they left maybe not all because of me, but I was a major part of it. I have to still be able to forgive myself and walk away with a lesson and not wallow in guilt. I have to have compassion and ask myself, what's the best thing I could do now in order to grow, take ownership of my life, but with compassion. So there's a real element here of, yes, the Lucas were broken and a whole chunk of your life like you said goodbye to but I would not call it a waste I would not call it valueless and inconsequential there's no such a thing every neshama has its journey we don't know where that journey takes us what we have to learn during that journey who are the people we affect during that journey we don't see the full picture every soul has a journey and this was part of your journey and forgive yourself for the fact that this journey now was terminated and a new journey begins. And you're going to learn a lot from your first journey and it's going to inspire your new journey. But there is pain and there is grief and there's naturally this very negative feeling towards this other person. You were trying to build a beautiful future with them and it broke, it got destroyed. So I would just make a few very practical, you know, very just down to points that I think are just practical and relevant. Number one, it's so important to be able to have support. Don't isolate. This is true for women. It's especially true for men who tend to isolate. People get divorced and they go into isolation and all their emotions they're experiencing on their own. Don't go into isolation. You must continue to have relationships with friends, with a rabbi, with a rebbitzin, with confidants, with family, with therapists. Number one. Number two, often people don't know how to talk to loved ones or to friends after they get divorced. Some may go to some may go to the some may go to the opposite extreme and say stupid things and say inappropriate things. Some are awkward and they barely tell you good Shabbos. Be comfortable to tell people around you where you are and how they could be here for you. Also, people don't often know how they can help you. They sometimes don't know how they can help you, how they can be here for you. 
They just don't know. They don't want to hurt you, but sometimes they are hurting you. Be comfortable to reach out and communicate to people what you need, what you don't need, what is appropriate, what isn't, what is inappropriate, when you would appreciate an invitation, when you wouldn't appreciate an invitation. In other words, people are sometimes really, really clueless. So don't go into isolation and start judging them when you could really try to reach out and communicating. You may be surprised because some people will really care and be very, very kind. Also, when you feel emotionally overwhelmed, seek help, whatever that help looks like. It's very, very important. Don't be ashamed to seek the help that you need. Take care of yourself. Make time for your hobby. If you don't have a hobby, find one. If you don't have a project, find one. Self-care is so important. Sometimes there are divorced spouses. I see mothers, they nonstop work and work and work until literally they fall into bed exhausted at night. You deserve some fun time, some rest time, some leisure time. You really, really have to nurture yourself. This is so, so important. And to be able to grieve for the past and then to say, yes, this is very painful. And now I want to take everything I learned from the past and begin a new future with much more awareness, with much more depth and with much more authenticity. So uh, let's start. Let's touch on the second topic. Hopefully, we can cover it tonight, and uh, we'll leave the other ones. We're going to get a little bit technical now. A lot of questions came in like this. Again, this is general advice, um, Rabbi Huawei. I think maybe the first two, three questions, maybe Mrs. Letterberger will answer first, and then you'll chime in if you want to add on to it. Okay, sure. Mrs. Letterberger, are you there? Yep, no problem. Okay, here we go. These are some of the questions that came in. Again, not legal advice, just as a friend. Just give us some little guidance for some of these issues. Yeah. I really want to get my divorce via Besden. However, I was told that I would be much more lenient on child support and nothing is really enforceable. I don't want to, but I feel I should go through the court system to protect me and my children. What is your advice? So listening to the question, I'm not sure why the questioner wants to be in court. Is, is he or she financially motivated or does he or she perceive the spouse as harmful? So an abusive situation is beyond the scope of this forum. Um, but financially, what you're hearing from other people isn't necessarily true. Um, you know, everyone knows someone who claims to have been in a situation exactly like yours. Um, and in my experience, that's never once been the case. In every situation, you have to run the child support formula. New Jersey has a, an exact guidelines. You punch in the numbers, it spits out a number. Um, and then you have to see what child expenses would the Besden typically place on the non-custodial parent or the father um, that the court wouldn't consider. And sometimes it's a wash um, and sometimes it's not. And then you also have to look at the big picture financially where a Besden may allocate certain assets very differently than a court would. So if this question is really financially motivated, that's something you want to consider as well. There's a lot more to say, but I think that gives, you know, that's in a nutshell okay. the answer. Okay, let's, let's go to another question, which is, I think, a little bit more emotional also, but it's important. Rabbi, maybe you can jump in also after, after her. The second we decided to get divorced, my ex ran to the most ruthless lawyers, expensive lawyers, writing up multiple motions against me, calling me dangerous and basically trying to take away my children from me. Trying to take away my children from me. I am scared. I can't believe the person I was married to for almost 20 years is after my blood. What should I do? How do I deal with, I feel like I'm losing my children. Uh -huh. um, did, did you want me to answer or should Rabbi? No, no. Yeah, I'll yeah, let it go, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, I mean, like I said before, it's always better to fight back strongly and right away. Um, not only because I'm an attorney am I saying that. I, uh, I see that when people sit back and take it easy and hope that things will go away, um, you know, either because an Askin says he'll make it go away or the person doesn't believe anyone could possibly think, you know, he or she would do something so terrible or for any number of reasons. Um, if someone sits back, even though there may not have been an issue before, like I said, you know, the simple lapse in time from seeing the child now has created an issue in, one, in, in what would once may have been a strong relationship. So you really need to fight back strongly 
um, and, and don't hope things will go away. The fact that the ex ran to the most ruthless, expensive lawyer shows where his or her mindset is. Um, and and you, you need to fight back. Um, now, you know, typically, unless there's some serious abuse and, and DIFUS involvement going on, um, a non-custodial parent will get to see the children in the end. But then the question is after how long, um, under what circumstance? And, you know, I don't mean to scare anyone and I'm sure many listeners know this, um, but, you know, parenting time could be supervised. It could be conditioned on reunification therapy. It could be limited to non-overnight time or any, any other number of conditions. So if serious allegations are being made against the parent, um, they need to respond because they may know the allegations aren't true. But remember, the judge doesn't know doesn't know you. He only knows as much information as is in front of him or her. But Leia, what would you tell somebody who says that his spouse or her spouse has endless money, endless money, the family's investing everything, and they're just so ruthless and self-centered, they're ready to destroy this person. What, what, what should this person do? He doesn't have all this money, doesn't have, like, you're saying fight back. What would you suggest to this person? Let me, let me, let me, let me. Let me. You're in the bud. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I want to critique the question a little bit. If somebody's a regular normal parent, no matter if the person has $100 million and has the best lawyers, in, in America today, is somebody going to lose his children, not be able to see his children? You're, you're asking me that? Yeah, I'm asking you that. Yeah, yeah, Leia. I have, I, again, I don't mean to scare anyone, but yes, I've seen you know, yesh me ayin, you know, an allegation morphing and, and, and taking on a life of its own. Um, and really, as you said before, the children really suffer in the end. Um, but no matter how much money someone has, there has to be hard facts. So don't sit back and, and let police reports or let DCPP or whatever, you know, kind of create and paper a record with no underlying facts. You know, if there's no token and if you nip it in the bud, you can do it. But at the point that things drag on for months and months, and now there's a paper trail, perhaps created from nothing, DV, criminal charges, has to show them, but now it's taken on a life of its own. And the custodial parent has now built a case where judges will err on the side of caution. But yes, it, it is expensive, but you know, it's Kadai. <laughs> Very, very, very important message Leia is telling us. I would just like to add into this discussion. There's a Jew I know in Israel. His name is Reptuvia, Reptuvia Pelas. And he shared once something that was very moving for me. We all know that story about King Solomon, Shloim HaMelech, right? The two mothers come and they're fighting over a child. Every mother says, it's my child. Your child is the dead child. This, the living child is mine. And we don't know who's the real mother and who's the liar, right? And Shleim HaMelech says, bring me a sword. We're going to cut the child in half. And that's when one mother says, no, 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 give it away. And the other mother says, no, gamli gamloch lo yir. We both won't have the kid, just kill the child. But the main thing is the other mother doesn't have it. And we all know Shleim HaMelech says, okay, we know who the real mother is the one who wanted the child to live, and he gives her the mother, and everybody is in awe of his wisdom. And then everybody asks the question, what type of piece of advice is this? Take a sword and cut a child in half? And, and what if the real mother wouldn't have screamed and the other mother wouldn't have given her true colors away? What would happen then? would kill a child. It's a difficult story. There's a lot of different approaches. But this Jew says that once he was visiting the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and the Rebbe told him, in a private audience, a psychological and spiritual interpretation. He said that sometimes two people are fighting over a child and the king says, cut the child into two. Cut the child, not physically, emotionally. And one person says, yeah, at least the other person won't get it. The main thing is, gam li, gam lak la yeah. you will not own the child. Ah, you're destroying the child's life. You're cutting this child into two. You're splintering them into pieces. They don't know who they are, where they belong to. Everybody is using them as a missile against the other. But somebody who's not a real parent is ready to do that to a child. And the Rebbe told him, never, ever, ever, if you're a real parent, you never do this to a child. So 
I would say to everybody who's listening and everybody who's going to listen, everybody who has influence on somebody, the parent who's doing the alienating, the parent who's doing the alienating because of our deep, deep, deep anger, our deep resentment, frustration, hatred, our own mental illness that we're suffering, our own trauma, whatever it is, don't cut the child into two pieces just that the other person shouldn't get it. Do not do that. You know what? You Maybe you'll hurt your spouse, your ex, 10%, but 90% of the suffering is going to be your child. So you are so angry at him and you're going to get him back and you're not going to let him see his son or his daughter or the other way around. You'll hurt him. But 90% of the hurt is your children, emotionally, psychologically. What type of marriages are they supposed to have when they grow up? A real mother and a real father, despite all of our pain and all of our hurt and all of our grief, and it's real and it's authentic and it's hard to deal with. But we always ask, first question, what is really the best thing for this beautiful, beautiful child, for my daughter, for my son? to be able to have the best chance to grow up in a normal and wholesome and stable environment and to become the human being and the great person, the great soul that God sent down to this world. And to the parent who's being alienated, to the parent who's being alienated, you heard Leia's advice from a professional, from a professional point of view, which I think is, is very, very, very important. The only thing I would add is don't, don't allow yourself to become consumed by another person's bad choices. Do what you have to do in order to protect your children. Do what you have to do for the safety and well-being of yourself and your children. But don't stoop down to their level and become engaged in this endless emotional battle. You have to have people who will support you emotionally be able to deal with it, but you remain anchored in a space of goodness and love and light and resilience and fortitude. And for this, you have to have a good relationship with God. And I know it's hard because when you have this person who's doing all these things, we naturally just get in that mode and we sometimes lose our own humanness. So do what you have to do, but do it from a place of, of deep compassion of deep love and of deep positive connection with your eye on the ultimate objective, which is to give your children and yourself the best future. Okay, let's cover two more topics. I have two more questions in this, unless anybody else wants to ask live. And then we uh, maybe could even cover a third one tonight. Maybe we can cover the get tonight. Okay, um, uh, Mrs. Lederberger, this is really specifically for you. I know that you, I know you specialize in this. That's why I think this is a great question for you. Are you there? Yep. I spent over a year fighting in Bezdin with my ex. We both hired Tayonim. We had several sessions. We put in time, money, and effort in the Bet in the Torah. Now my ex isn't happy with the Psak, and he's taking me to court. It's to take a second bite of the apple. I don't feel like it started all over again, both financially and emotionally. Can I stop my ex from doing this to me? Yes or no? Oh, the quick answer is sometimes. Um, so it depends how knowledgeable the Bezdin was about the New Jersey Arbitration Act. Um, and, you know, like you said in the intro, I, I litigate this extensively. Um, so unlike in Israel, our secular court system obviously doesn't recognize the basin as a court with binding authority. So in New Jersey, the basin jurisdiction comes from the New Jersey Arbitration Act. It's a very detailed, particular law. And unless the law is followed to a T, it is possible for an unhappy party, um, you know, someone that lost at a dintaira uh, to relitigate. And, and it's a shame because, you know, Tawanam were hired, um, you know, money, Agmas Nefesh, um, you know, went down and, and then there you are relitigating. So I cannot emphasize enough to whoever is involved at Adin Taira, don't waste your time and money. Even if you think your ex-spouse is never going to take you to court, it really can hurt to make sure to have a binding and enforceable agreement to arbitrate. It's not just the star Bruin that the basin is gonna give you. It has to be pursuant to New Jersey law and you can find a form on the New Jersey court's website. Download it, sign it, it can't hurt. Um, and especially when children are involved. 
Um, custody and arbitration is very tricky. Make sure that the based and hired a competent attorney to oversee the process and the PSAC because the way the PSAC is written can sometimes you know, invalidate the entire custody process or make sure to have your own attorney's oversight, even if it's just peripherally. peripherally. Um, you know, it's, it's really a mistake not to, um, if you're gonna spend the time and effort um, in a dentira. Okay. I'm gonna ask one more question on this, by the way, I want you to chime in afterwards because it's a deep question. And Mr. Lutterberger, you can answer first. And anybody else who has any questions specifically about courts and fighting in Besden, now's the time you have a lawyer here that's here to help and give you some ideas. General, general that, guidance. <laughs> legal guidance, right? right. You know, it's like every investment guy, every YouTube video, this is not an investment advice, just, <laughs> and whatever why we're here. So this is the opportunity before we move into the next topic, which we'll be talking about, you know, withholding again, which is a very important topic also. Um, let, let's just, this is the final question of this, but it's, it's really very, very deep question. My lawyer is advising me, this is a man writing the question. My lawyer is advising me not to give into the normal custody arrangement of every other weekend or one or two dinners a week. He's promising me that if we fight for more custody, that, uh, that we'll get more and I'll even get full custody. I'm very conflicted. Should I just settle and move on? Or should I fight for more since I know the kids will be better off with me anyway and I'd rather have them by me? So the, the, the point I want to just mark off in the question is also, is that he's basically okay with settling, but the question is he wants to fight to get more. Is it worth it? And the, and the lawyers are stoking him up to do more. And also B, realistically, is it, you know, something, the right thing to do or not? I mean, I know it's a very broad question, but Ms. Lederberger, maybe you could answer it. So I guess what I'm hearing from the question is a little different than what you're taking away from it. And that's a non-custodial parent's genuine concern for his children, for his children's well-being. He's willing to settle because of what people are telling him. Mm -hmm. um, but he knows he can't maintain the same Kesher he once had by limiting his relationship to twice a week. And what's troubling to me when hearing this question, and I hear this all the time, so it's no offense to whoever asked this, um, how did limiting a non-custodial parent's time with his or her children become normal? Um, when the family is intact, you know, both, both parents are there, whatever their schedule is, but they're there every day. So I guess it takes some soul searching to know whether the true motivation behind this question is really to benefit one's children. And also, you know, if it takes some true soul searching to know if he wasn't a primary caregiver before, can he really take on more time with his children? Um, does he really want that huge responsibility? Is it realistic for him from a scheduling standpoint to spend more time with his children? Or is he just, you know, wanting to grab because he can and his lawyer is telling him he can. Um, but if it is realistic for the questioner to spend more time with his children, and if he has professional input from a therapist, from the children's therapist perhaps, um, and, and from the people around the children, seeing the children will be better off, I would say to go for it because these are your children. Just as much as they are ex-spouses, you brought them into the world as well. And children really do benefit from having two loving, involved, parents in their lives. I, you know, I, I see it all the time. Um, so you, you have to do some soul searching. Um, but if, if it's, mo if it's coming from a genuine place, I, I would say go for it. You only have children once, you know? Right. And, and I would add maybe practically, maybe you need help and advice from somebody to really make sure that this decision is based on what will be the benefit of the children not what this one is saying or that one is saying or to score this victory or that victory, yeah. but what will really, really benefit the children, as Leia said. And I think it's just important to add in a general way and in a general note, you know, it's so important. It's so important. We all know in the best marriages and great couples and beautiful functional homes where there is basic livelihood and people are normal and civil, it's not easy to raise children today. <laughs> You know, everybody is struggling. There's a lot of distractions, a lot of trauma emerging, a lot of different factors that you always have on these shows, you know, in terms of education and learning disabilities and emotional challenges and mental challenges, et cetera, et cetera. Never mind when there's such a challenge of a family being broke, a family splitting up where there's a divorce situation, even if it was really important and necessary to do Let's take that for granted for a moment. But now, you know, Patti is in one home and mommy's in another home. 
So we all have to be mature. We have to become mature people. You have to become a great person. And even though all of us have pettiness inside of us and all of us have a Yetzirah and all of us get jealous and all of us have difficult moments and we all lose it once in a while and that's fine. You're a human being. But it's so important to, you know, to, to paraphrase Thomas Paine, these are times that try men's and women's souls. When this happens to a family, you know, realize in, in, in the best situation, it's hard to raise children. So it's so important for both of us for the mommy and Tati who are now divorced, to really rise to the occasion and say, you know, yes, our marriage didn't work out for whatever reason. But the bottom line is, let's be invested together to give our children the best possible future. And that means, number one, to realize that a child needs two parents and needs two loving parents and celebrate the fact and even if you despise, you despise him or you despise her. You, and and for maybe for good reason, we're really not judging that at all. But, you know, remember that this is your child's father forever. And this is your child's mother forever. And them having a good, loving relationship where they can feel safe and secure and soothed and seen by both of their parents is so, so important. And this consideration must transcend almost every other consideration in the world. I said almost, maybe every other consideration, probably every other consideration in the world. And not because we're not weak and we don't have our difficult moments, but you know, but, 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 but let's face it again, and even in the best homes, it's so difficult, certainly when you have all these challenges. So give them, give them that opportunity. Give them that opportunity. If you have to compromise, compromise. If I have to go beyond my ego and beyond my insecurity and beyond my fear, yeah, this is what behooves me. And when you're going to be 95 years old, remember, when you're going to be 95 years old, I don't think when you look back, you will regret that your divorce was civil and that your relationship with your ex post the divorce was respectful, dignified, civil, always making sure that the children get what they need physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, socially. You know, I have a situation there. I just, it's so painful. A, a guy, I don't know, probably you can call him a monster. I don't like judging people. He tells his ex, he says, I'm not gonna, they had, they had a child together. They got divorced, bitter divorce. I'm not gonna give you one day of peace. I'm gonna bury you and bury you and bury you and bury you. How do you call yourself a ben teire? The Shem Sechnesh to speak like this? You're not embarrassed to speak like this? You're not embarrassed? You know, all of our Yerush we talk about Hashem, 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 and it all goes right into the dustbin. When we're angry at somebody, we're angry at our spouse, I'm going to bury you. I'm not going to give you a day of peace. Where, where, where does a person come to say such words? And how is this person protected by parents and by siblings who pat them on their back. Don't stand by when your brother or sister's blood is being spilled. It's the responsibility of classmates and friends and, and rabbis and rabbis and mommies and tatis to stand up. And even if there's a disagreement, it doesn't give you a right to enter into a world of blood and vengeance and revenge and hatred. And who's going to suffer? It's not just... First of all, your ex is also a person, also has an image of God. You have to respect them as a person, even if you're not meant to be married to each other. That's number one. The whole Torah is about, Mad Hillel said, the whole Torah is what you dislike to be done to you, don't do it to anybody else. Just because we got divorced, just because we have our quarrels and our bickering and our disputes and we couldn't be married together, therefore it gives me a right to lose all of my nobility, all of my menschlichkeit, all of my refinement, all of my humanism, and literally behave like a monster. And such people have to be confronted by their families and friends. This behavior is not allowed because every one of these guys is getting protection from somebody. Good job, good job. Teach, teach, teach her or teach him. This is not how we should behave, my friends. Hey, try to have a way. Um, I think we should end on this note tonight, if that's okay, because the next topic is a big topic and it's going to uh, take it from there. Okay? okay. So first, uh, before we go to closing, I just wanted to say, first of all, for coming on tonight for part one. We have so many more parts to cover, and we'll cover them. As of now, we're June 6th. Okay, we'll confirm with everybody. 
and we'll cover all those other topics. Um, again, everything tonight is recorded. It's going to be on MenachemBerenfeld.com's website. Uh, if you have any questions, please email him, coachmenachem at gmail.com. And uh, tonight's share is number 55, it's, and it's going to be on, on our phone number. You can listen to it later. It's 848-777-GROW. I want to give a special thank you to all the advertising sponsors, The Liquid Scoop, Rabbi Anif Chazak, Chayla Kaplan, Shmuel Sommer from JCN. I want to give a special thank you to Shasha Friedman and to Suri Cohen for helping with putting the questions in some type of order that came in so strong. And it was a, it was a great start on a big topic. I know Rabbi Wild can do so much more. We, we, just like, we just like getting the island warmed up. But uh, everybody's like texting, no, 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 we want to hear the whole thing. Uh, Mr. Shem will do it again and we'll email everybody, let everybody know. Um, let's go to closing. Coach Menachem, closing words. Uh, first of all, just to start this topic is really, from the emails that we got, it's really amazing how, how, much, how people need it, a place where they can talk and hear just basic ideas. But, and, and again, like I always like to finish this, when you're on this journey and you're in this place, sometimes you can't see any light and it doesn't sound like you'll be able to do anything that we heard tonight. Like if you feel your spouse is out there to get you and then they say, no, she, he, she's out to get me and I'm, he's out to get, where do we go back and forth? But again, like we're on this journey and it's process and it's work like everything else. So hopefully we'll be able to um, um, get somewhere in Mitzvah Shem. Um, some people did mention there are groups out there. Um, this is, uh, one is called Achim uh, Bader, which I guess is meant for men and their sister, sister to sister. And Rabbi Vigler has an organization. You can look it up and see um, how you can connect. But uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue in Mitzvah Shem to can uh, talk about this and ha um, help people get the help they need to get to the, the ultimate goal of everybody should be in a healthy place, whether it's you, your spouse, or your kids. And even though this was part, of, it, it is part of the journey. This is what Hashem wants from you now to be able to, to accept it, which takes time and how to deal with it. Thank you very much. Bye bye. -bye. You can't give the final yeah. one, just, uh, just the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I want to read something to you that somebody sent me. He's, uh, he's uh, a student of mine who got divorced a number of years ago. And um, before this evening, I called up a few people. First of all, I called up a few rabbis deal a lot with divorce to get their feedback. I called up a few therapists who deal a lot with this. And then I also called up some friends and disciples who have gotten divorced, Went men, women, to be able to hear feedback you know, from real people, because that's so important. So I want to share with you just some, something that somebody wrote to me from his own experience, and it was very moving. He says, one of the big mistakes I made was I did not realize when I got divorced that Hashem is real and I need a real relationship with Hashem. Now I realize how important that is. It saved my life. When things were so difficult and I felt so desperate, I realized that there is a true north and therefore I don't have to get petty. When I believe that Hashem really, really has my back in life, I can get through this very difficult change in my life, which really turned around my life. I had to realize that the structure of our from communities is all around marriage. School, Shabbos, Yom Tif, meals, school, other subbundant programs, camps. That's our community for good and for great. We are all about family. And when the family breaks down, Nobody knows what to do with it. And therefore, many of us leave Yiddishkeit, especially men. Divorced men, they don't always show it, but they leave Yiddishkeit. In their mind, they have no framework anymore. They have no community support. They're not part. You're bringing your kid, your kid up, whatever. It's all around family and children and children and children, and they feel they don't have it. And therefore, 
we leave Judaism. And I say to me and all my friends, you need God more than ever before. Don't feel guilty, but develop a good relationship with God and don't let your anger at the community and at your school and at your mother-in-law and at your father-in-law and at your ex cause you to lose that relationship. And then he says, I also learned how important it is for me to get support from people, to ask for help, to be real with people and to get advice from somebody who knows life, somebody who knows me, somebody who has a healthy marriage, somebody who knows what the true north is, somebody who can give me real advice about child support, somebody who can give me real advice about how to communicate with my ex, and somebody to help me realize that my moment of brokenness can bring me to a place of new awareness. Finally, this person writes to me, at different points in my life, I looked into my heart and I realized I want revenge. I want to continue to be angry. I want to continue to be a victim. I want to continue to be a loser. I want to get angry at the community and at God and at religion and at Yiddishkeit. I don't want to compromise. I just want to be upset. I want to be hurt. And then I learned that revenge will make me miserable and make all my kids miserable. And the most important thing for me is to be honest and realize that I have to pursue my innermost values and not allow my external moods to dictate the situation. This is what somebody who got divorced shared with me. He since remarried and rebuilt a beautiful life for himself. And that's what I wanna share with all of us. You know, It's a journey, it's a difficult journey. It's not easy, it's a big test. And we have to take the time, you know, there's the, they talk about death, right? There's always the five stages and they're very, very real part of life. You know, we all go through those stages of denial and anger and bargaining and grief and acceptance. And this is a form of, of, of losing something so special. And there's anger and there's denial and there's bargaining and then there's grief. And then there's acceptance and just realizing that we don't understand the mysteries of life. And the journeys are often very, very difficult and very overwhelming. And it's so important to be able to be real, to be able to be honest, to be able to have a very strong relationship with your soul, a very strong relationship with Hashem, and to surround yourself with those few individuals who will really bring the best out of you and will allow you to operate on your highest level of consciousness and not on your lowest level of consciousness. Again, people, just text me, I just want to repeat, the tonight's show will be on menachembernfeld.com. You can also sign up over there for his email and he'll email you when the next show will be and when everything will be so we can come back to, to all the other parts that we're going to cover. Again, everybody, good night. Thank you, Rabbi Y.Y. Shkoyach. Shkoyach. to everybody. Chazak, chazak. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.